I thought about what I might say this morning. Um, I found it quite a challenge. I found that uh, I had to go back a bit on my understanding of climate change and to try to reframe it in a more um, relevant way, I suppose, to, to the concerns of people like you, people who are at the cutting edge often of dealing with human rights, um, with, with equality, with a whole series of issues that are very deeply relevant to every human being on the planet. And so I've got a, a scientific presentation which I'll show you a little bit later that explains exactly what climate change is. So it's important that we have a look at that because um, unless we understand what is happening to the planet, what the mechanism is and how it's working, it's very hard to make sense of the details uh, and then apply that to, to the issues of human rights. But before I, I do that, I wanted to just talk a little bit about what climate change really is. And the only way that I could make sense of that in a, a short period of time is, is through analogy. Uh, and I've, I've learned as a scientist over my 30 or so years studying natural systems that the Earth system operates to some extent like a body. Um, it has its own metabolism, it has its own chemical balance, it has its own temperature which is maintained within relatively narrow bounds despite great variation in things like solar output and so forth. Uh, and the parts of the system work together in a, a, a way that creates a certain level of stability. Now, that idea is, is, is not a, a new one. James Lovelock, who developed the Gaia hypothesis, sort of put a name to that idea that the, the planet itself operates rather like a body. Um, but the point that I'm trying to make when I say that is that climate change really by analogy with the human body, what it is doing is raising the temperature of the organism and thereby altering the metabolism of that entity. So we don't, we're not entirely aware of it when we experience a fever in our own bodies, but what is happening is that the rates and nature of thousands of interactions across the body are altering in response to that temperature shift. Yeah because almost all of the major enzymic reactions and other reactions in our bodies are temperature controlled to some extent. They're, they're, they're sensitive to temperature. So when we um, get a fever, um, we may find that there, there's various manifestations of that. We sweat, we, we, um, we can uh, shiver, so forth, uh, trying to shed that excess heat, but inside a whole lot of really important stuff's happening. The same is true for the planet. So when we raise the temperature of the planet, for example, the, the, um, the, the, the reactions that are occurring in our soils alter so that there is an outgassing of carbon in the soils, the metabolic activity alters, that changes our plant our water interactions, changes nutrient availability, and so forth. So these are deep changes that occur at metabolic level within the organism that we call our Earth. So that is the best way that I can, I think, can give you a a sort of a, a broad overview of what climate change does at the organistic level, at the, the level of the planet. Now, what re relevance does any of that have to people? I'm no lawyer, but I guess there's a few basic rights that I reckon that everyone uh, should be able to enjoy. And those rights that I think need to be extended to every human being are rights to water and food, some of the fundamentals, the basics that, that uh, we cannot exist without. I reckon everyone has got a right to a nationality too. Everyone, um, we, don't, we shouldn't have stateless people in this world. We, people have a right to a nationality and to be able to live in a nation. People also need some sort of protection, perhaps they arguably have a right to protection from damaging rates of change, to uh, rates of change that have severe impacts on people uh, that are imposed from outside. And of course, we all have a right to life. And all of those things, to one extent or another, are impacted by climate change. But climate change is really different, I think, from many of the issues that lawyers used to deal with in terms of, of human rights. And that's because, in essence, the, the problem is caused by our very success. Until recently, 
greenhouse gas emissions have been tightly coupled with economic development. So the gases that uh, they're, they're sort of the waste product of our very success are those that are causing problems globally. Now that has started to change over the last decade. We've seen a decoupling, a gradual decoupling of economic growth in the most developed countries from the production of greenhouse gases, which is a really encouraging shift. But this is very late in the day for that sort of shift to have an impact because year by year we keep on producing more greenhouse gases. That they went up something on like three or four percent last year. We're now producing 40 gigatons, 40 billion tons of greenhouse gases a year. Um, and that will continue to grow as the Indians and Chinas of the world continue uh, their economic trajectory. So those gases are the waste product of our success. Who's producing them? If you look at the list of nations around the world that are producing greenhouse gases, US and China top that list, both producing around about 18 to 19 percent of the world's total each. But after that, nations' production of greenhouse gases drop off very dramatically. There's the two big ones, then there's a whole lot of smaller ones that are producing 1 to 2 percent of the world's total of greenhouse gases. Ranked 15th among those is Australia, so we're the 15th, 16th largest producer, somewhere in that range. We produce about 1.5 percent of the world's greenhouse gases. So it's a very long tail of countries, another 170 odd behind us uh, producing less. And of course, within those countries, there are different corporations that are responsible to one degree or another for producing those greenhouse gases. I guess from an international perspective, if anyone was to sue anyone, or take a class action based on damage caused by greenhouse gas pollution, um, it will be a complex field. Because uh, I imagine we have to have some sort of link between the molecule and where it was produced and the damage it did. And in a highly dynamic atmosphere where there's enormous fluxes of carbon and there's so many sources of emissions, I imagine that's going to be a challenging thing to do. I did meet incidentally some lawyers in New Orleans just um, uh, within a year of uh, uh, Cyclone Katrina being in that city, who were suing a number of large polluters in the US on behalf of the citizens of New Orleans who lost their homes and so forth. And uh, it was interesting meeting the sort of hard bitten lawyerly type, so there's American ones you with know, a cigarette in the mouth and something like that, beaten down slightly by things. Um, and I said, How's it going? And they said to me, Oh, well, the other side's got big smiles on their face, you know, one of them said. And the other guy said, Ah, oh, yeah, that's true. He said, when I, when I took the tobacco industry on 30 years ago, they had big smiles on their faces too. So they're taking a very long term view of this issue. Um, and I think that's what we need to do, because this issue truly is intergenerational. The big impacts of climate change of the gases we put up now are going to be felt uh, by our grandchildren. And could I just say, you know, that the, the, the greenhouse gases that were put up by my grandmother when she was using her uh, charcoal stove or her briquette beaker are still affecting me today. Those greenhouse gases last a century in a year on average. So its actions that were taken a while ago are still having an impact on us. As our actions now will have an ongoing impact for a century or more into the future. I just want to talk to you briefly about some anecdotal information that I've gathered as I've travelled around the world looking at uh, climate change issues. Um, and I bring them up to underline the point that it is the most disadvantaged people on our planet who suffer the impacts first. So, in a world where economic development is coupled with greenhouse gas generation, those who produce the gases do very well. Those who don't produce the gases, suffer. those who don't produce the gases, are most vulnerable to the consequences. And I'll just talk about three examples that I've seen as I've travelled around. One was in Sabah on the island of Borneo, where I visited um, some Dayak people and talked to older men and women there. And they, this was before our wars and inconvenience and all the rest of it. They were very aware of the changing climate in their part of the world and were able to tell me in considerable detail how nightime temperatures have changed, how rainfall patterns have changed, how peak heats during the day, peak heat loads have changed, and what some of those impacts were on their life and on the wildlife of the region. So these people who live in grass huts, effectively, 
are very close to nature, they don't have air conditioning to switch them off from that, and they are very aware of what we would consider subtle changes, but which then are significant changes. Incidentally, Australians are a bit like that, some Australians are like that too. I remember talking to Shearers in Western New South Wales about climate change. They were all putting it against saying it's a load of bullshit, you know. And then I said to them, well, when was the last time that you that you your shaving mark or your glass of water while your bed froze over? And one old shearer said, I said, geez, you know, that was that must have been about the 70s when that happened. I said, well, you know why? It's because nighttime temperatures are going up. It's where, that's where the register of climate change is most sensitive is at night because there's no solar radiation, there's no sunlight to vary the issue. It's just the, the blanket of greenhouse gases trapping the heat that gives you a reliable register. So we notice it in our own lives sometimes. We may not call it climate change, but it exists. Here in Melbourne, the initial frosts, how many people who've lived in the city a long time remember how frosty it used to be in the winter uh, in Melbourne 30, 40 years ago compared to today. The second example I want to mention of climate impacts was in Kenya, in Africa. In uh, 2007, I got to travel to northern Kenya to meet with people who are uh, pastoralists. They have goats and, and, um, and uh, cattle as their main wealth, main form of wealth. They belong to very old neonotic cultures that have been there for a very long time, many thousands of years. And they're exquisitely adapted to their environment. When I visited, they were in the middle of a horrendous drought, the likes of which they had never seen before, and I talked to the oldest men in the community in their 80s, I presume, although they didn't know their age, who say, in their memory and their grandfather's memory, nothing like this had happened before. And in those societies, those old men play a critical role. Their job is to advise the younger men where to take the cattle and goats in order to find water and forage. And their knowledge of resources across the landscape over vast areas and of climatic impacts over that, uh, that region are incredibly detailed and are based on the observations of not just their fathers and grandfathers, but observations that have been passed on through the generations. And when I went, there was one of the saddest things I think I've, I've seen in, in the climate area. I went into a village, talked to the old men about this, and I was so delighted to have someone who was interested in this issue to talk to. And I said, well, what's happening today? And they said, well, we've become irrelevant. We, we're, we're, we're useless now. And I said, so why is that? He said, because we can't tell the young men where to take the cattle and sheep anymore. Conditions are so utterly changed that our knowledge is now useless. And I thought, wow, what a, a striking impact of climate change. And how that works in with human rights, I don't know. But I do know that those changes that we would, um, within a highly technological society, be perhaps less cognizant of, for them was absolutely central in a, in a, in a pre literate society where handed on knowledge is essential to survival. Once you get a change in the metabolic rate of the planet that alters rainfall, alters evaporation rates, alters soil metabolism and so forth, you have a major impact that, is, that those people are exclusively <coughs> sensitive to. The final example I want to talk about is in Papua New Guinea where I worked for many, many years. Um, in 1995, I went into a very remote area of Papua New Guinea, right next to the border with Iri and Jaya, and did surveys in a valley up there that was um, untouched uh, by people. It was uh, uh, just to the uh, west of a place called Telefoma. And it, when I walked in over a very steep ridge, it was very difficult getting into this place. Um, I discovered the most majestic oak forest that I think I've ever seen. And in the middle, elevations of the New Guinea mountains. There's a, a several species of tropical oaks that grow to be this diameter. They're majestic trees um, and the acorns are about that big around. They're, they're eaten by possums and giant rats and all the other fauna of the region. And we went into that valley and did a formal survey and discovered several new species of animals, including one possum, quite a large possum that was entirely unknown to science, was most likely restricted. To, that, to those valleys in that, that region. I did a lot of my survey work by talking to people. It's the best way to go to the, the local hunters and the experts. They're the professors when it comes to the biology of, of their area. And all of them keep trophy jaws. So if they catch an animal like a tree kangaroo, they will 
uh, take the jaws off the skull, smoke them by the fire and put them on a trophy rack above their doorway. And those trophy jaws are a great way of uh, finding out how much protein people get, what the biodiversity of the region is, and, and quite frankly how good a hunter someone is, because good hunters have lots of trophy jewels. I returned to that area in, in 2001, and flew in by helicopter this time. I was, very, was getting into a better position to just doing my biological surveys by then. Um, and the second we came over the ridge into that valley, my heart sank, because instead of a majestic oak forest, in that, that valley. There was nothing but, but ashes and dead trees. It was the most extraordinary transformation I've ever seen in the year. And I landed in the village where I'd done work before and um, just asked people what had happened. These are the same people I've been with in 95. And they said, oh, it was the most incredible event that we've ever had in this area in 1998. Remember the, the, the El Nino year of 1998. They said, oh, the sky became incredibly clear, there was no clouds, unusual for New Guinea, for, for, for months at a time, and the frosts, at 1500 metres elevation, so in a tropical environment, the frosts were so severe, because the sky was clear and had no moisture in it, that the trees all dropped their leaves, they got frostbitten, the tropical trees lost all of their leaves, they fell to the forest floor, and then a fire started. No one knows how it started, people, most likely people started it, you know, not enough for sure. And the forest burned for months, they said, and was burning underground for months after the forest above the bombs. There's huge accumulations of peaking vegetation in the soil that just kept on burning. And I remember going back to the hunters' huts and found they were full of jawbones of the rarest and biggest animals, the most difficult to hunt. Even blokes I knew who were really crappy hunters had done incredibly well. They caught all these tree kangaroos. In. So I suppose that's a benefit of climate change in a way, that even the crappy hunters have been able to get their hands on some tree kangaroos. The trouble was those tree kangaroos had been packed into the few surviving areas of forest that hadn't burnt, these tiny patches, which ultimately burnt anyway. And they'd been able to hunt very successfully. But the forest, not only were the tree kangaroos now gone and the red possums gone, the forest itself had gone. And that was due, and when I asked her, I said, have you seen anything like this before in living memory? Does anyone have any idea or even tradition that anything like this has ever happened before? And they all said, absolutely not. This, is, this was just beyond our reckoning that such a thing would happen. So climate-related shifts, 1998 was one of those gateway years when the world's climate did change significantly, get extreme events that are unknown and have an impact, in that case for short-term benefit but long-term deprivation. Having said that, I really just want now to go on to uh, give you this presentation which is part of the Australian Climate Commission's presentations that we give to people. This is a slightly more technical version of it, but I thought I should show you this one because uh, if, if there's too many graphs and you cross over, let me know, but uh, I think it does have a good story to tell. The presentation was put together by Professor Will Stephan, one of our climate commissioners. He's one of the world's most respected climate scientists. And um, uh, the, the data in this really is pretty evolutive. If I can just show you um, briefly, you probably won't be able to read these, but where's my little... Yeah. This here is, this is a graph of just rising oceans. You know, the oceans absorb 90% of the heat that the atmosphere traps due to greenhouse, uh, due to the increased burden of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And as a result, the oceans warm and rise and ice melts. There's three entirely independent studies there going back from 1950 to 2010, just showing that trend. It's a much more even trend than the atmospheric warming trend, which is this one, because the oceans are 500 times bigger than the atmosphere, and therefore they're like juggernauts. They take a lot more time to respond to a heat burden. So a lot of the spikiness is, is, is evened out in the ocean graph compared with the atmospheric graph. But they basically show the same thing. You can see here for the warming in the atmosphere, four independent studies from around the world, different groups, Japanese Meteorological Agency, NASA, Met Office in London, and so forth. You've got the same pattern, uh, completely in accordance with what we expect to see as the greenhouse gas burden increases. 
Here you can see these little pigs, these are volcanic eruptions, so they don't have too much of an impact on the overall trend. So whatever volcano is doing is not that important. This graph here, we can see projections for sea level rise. This was this is sea level rise as recorded. Here we've got a series of projections by the scientific community made in 2005 about where they thought sea level rise might go. And there's the lower limit to the, what they thought might happen. There's the upper limit. And there's the kind of median range in the projections. And that spiky line is the actual measurements at the time. So you can see, again, we're at the upper limit of projections. Here, this is to do with the Arctic sea ice. We've got here, that's the real world that data and an envelope of projections around it. So you know, this is uncertainty. And they scientists project into the future what's going to happen to the sea ice. There's the median projection. There's the envelope of probability from lower bound to the ice extent to upper bound. The red line is the actual data up to 2000. And as we speak now, the sea ice is at its absolute lowest extent it has ever been uh, at, at this time of year, for June, June, July. So this is clearly in free fall. Um, beyond the projections. What that sort of data tells us is that the, the models are conservative. They're not giving us the whole story. There's still things we don't understand in the climate system. Um, and so we will see surprises in the future. This is just temperature for the northern hemisphere. And, and apology for all the lines here, but these, I just want to give you a sense of the scale of the scientific enterprise endeavour here. Here's instrumental record, here's a whole lot of modelling, here's the envelope of uncertainty, here's the real data. This is from 200 AD, 2000 AD. Here is the temperature rising as the Industrial Revolution starts to rise. Ah, Why is this all happening? I'll go very quick. Was that my final yes. word here? Thank you. Um, there's the sun, the main power, power source for our planet, nuclear power at a safe distance. Um, radiation coming into the Earth goes back out. Some of that radiation turns the heat energy. Um, it bounces back down. So the greenhouse <coughs> gases act like a bit of a blanket for you. It's holding some of the heat for a bit longer at the surface than it would normally stay. Over time, that incremental um, increase in heat affects the Earth just like a blanket on a bed uh, on a warm night would affect you. I'll leave that because we're, we're getting running out of time here. I just want to show you this. Why, why is it that only carbon dioxide can explain the warming? Here's a really good uh, example of that. What we have here is um, two, two lots of projections. The blue is a projection that only takes into account physical changes in the planet, such as solar radiation, volcanoes, other natural phenomena. So that's what the temperature should be doing if there was no human activity. The red line, the red series of projections, factors in human emissions. So that's what happens if you get industrial gases going into the atmosphere. The black line is the real world data. So the real world data for measurements is consistent with models that take into account human greenhouse gases, entirely inconsistent with models that only take in natural phenomena. You see here that's global. This is global land, global ocean, the same sort of thing. Here's Australia, here's Asia, here's Europe, North America, South America, and Africa, every continent showing exactly the same thing. There is no doubt that it's us that are causing these climate changes. There's no other explanation um, for the observed data than that these human emitted greenhouse gases that are causing these changes. Put this in just to show you a few impacts. There, there always has been a lot of weather variability. There's always been a lot of climate variability caused by natural factors. And there are extreme events. What the human caused greenhouse gases are doing is shifting the bell curve a little bit. This bell curve here shows you the average temperatures um, in the past. Here is the shift with the human greenhouse gases. And you can see what happens. You get less cold weather over here more hot weather here, but more record hot weather. So you don't need to shift 
the bell curve very much, the bell curve of distribution of, say, hot versus cold days, in order to create lots of new record hot weather. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Here, um, Australian climate reference stations, this is the very hot days over time, by decade, from 1960 through to 2010. And here is the yearly record. You can see how high it peaks in 2009 as we get to the end of that big dry here in southern Australia. Just show this graph briefly. This is stream flow into Perth's dams from 1900 through to about 2010. The climate shifts in steps. Here's the average for this period. In 1976, go through a magic gateway, as the scientists call them in the climate system. You shift to a lower mean, and then down and down again. 2010, Perth got 2% of its average annual flows prior to 1976 into its dams. So the rainfall uh, in there just isn't, is changed, soil temperatures have changed to such an extent that the dams don't feel. Impacts on, sorry, human caused infrastructure. Of Coral reefs, fires, flooding, you are probably used to the extreme consequences of extreme events. I just want to finish with this graph here. This shows you two alternative futures for humanity. So here's the observed data. Here's what the scientists are projecting will happen if we don't take action to reduce our greenhouse gases. And here's what may happen if we do. That's the what's called the safety guardrail. That's the point beyond which wise people won't let the temperature <coughs> increase uh, for fear of very serious consequences. Now my lifetime, and at least goes from about here, and it might go to about there. So I'm pretty safe, no matter what I do, yeah? <laughs> but my kids were born in 1985, right about here, and they might live to about here. So my kids, they're going to face a very different future, depending on what I do now. Not on what they do, but what on I do now. My grandkids, if I'm ever lucky enough to have any, presumably going to be born somewhere around there, and they're going to be right in the thick of it. So that's the take home message. This is an intergenerational problem. We, we will feel impacts now. We won't feel the sort of impacts that our grandchildren will potentially feel if we don't take action. Thank you very much. <laughs>
and you can imagine the sort of potential for conflict that might exist in the future under those scenarios. Um, so there has to be a role for law, but I think it has to be a different sort of law. I'm not a legal expert, but it has to be the sort of law that takes into account probable impacts on future generations, that takes into account um, the fact that this is a collective problem in a way. It's a collective problem which has arisen from our very success at a time when we were unaware of the consequences of what we're doing. So up until the 1970s, the world had no real idea about the consequences of the greenhouse gas pollution that they were producing. Today there's no excuse for that. Today we know in more detail than ever what the consequences of our ongoing actions are. So I, I don't know quite how, if the legal system is up to working in a global context, across jurisdictions, across generations, um, to deliver some sort of equity, but I think that's the challenge for, for this particular kind of problem. Further questions? Uh, if you have a question, um, a, a Roman microphone will be brought to you. And it would be very helpful if you could, before you uh, ask the questions, give your name to us. Oh, hi. My name is Annette Brennan, and I'm from Monash University. I'm interested to know if in areas such as you mentioned, like Papua New Guinea, where the people could see definite changes in the climate due to deforestation, if there's an opportunity for people, in a legal sense, to take it up with their governments, because it is the governments that make the decision, for example, in Papua New Guinea, the Japanese coming in and doing all the logging, I know we've got illegal lobbying in other areas, but I'm talking about where they've legally been allowed to actually come and do something, whether the people can take action against that. Look, can I just say that um, those changes I saw in Papua New Guinea weren't due to logging, as far as we can tell. They were due to a shift in the global climate that produced a very severe El Nino event, which deprived the atmosphere of moisture over the mountains of New Guinea. And that lack of see, moisture in the atmosphere is a greenhouse gas, it keeps thick in. So when the sky clears and you get less cloud and less moisture, the nights become very cold. And that allowed the frost to kill the trees, which are very frost sensitive because they're tropical trees, and cause the fire. So that was a slightly different situation. Uh, and I, I, I just say that as a point of clarity. But in terms of the point you're asking, whether legal uh, means are available for people to, to take action on the part of, uh, to prevent logging, uh, I've seen extraordinary conflict in New Guinea around this. In Papua New Guinea, tribal land is 97% of the land, tribally owned land or plan owned land in the country. Uh, and yet the, the government of PNG gives away uh, the right to log on that land to various companies, often without consulting the local landowners or with inadequate consultation. Um, I think I'm, it's fair to say there is a fair degree of corruption involved in that too. There are inducements offered all over the place, and you can imagine how tempting they might be to someone where a logging company can make millions of dollars um, from getting access to high quality timber. Um, but I think there, there has to be um, legal uh, uh, pathways. I know that there was recently some legislation passed in PNG that had attempted to block landowner action uh, to appeal these things. Um, but just as a matter of natural human justice, it seems to me that where the land is owned by people, uh, they should have a say in how it's used. And could I just say that the worst examples I've seen of the deforestation in this way is in the Solomon Islands, where um, it's been, I saw some extraordinary examples where people uh, signed uh, agreements with logging companies without any legal advice, whatever. Uh, the most extraordinary agreements, you know, that I don't think people would even read them but the 40 pages of detailed stuff that said, we'll do this, we'll build a hospital, we'll build a school, we'll do this, and we'll take access to your forests. And the last paragraph said that the company will be held um, liable to do none of the above. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> so, yeah. and, and when you see the old, old men who go out hunting, going back into the forest, it's like a changed landscape for them because they used to own it by the trees. It's like they're on the moon. They lost in their own country because all of their this sort of the orientation because the land itself is so changed by removing forests. So I think something needs to be done, um, but I, you know, we take some very smart lawyers, I think, who are willing to work in difficult circumstances to achieve. Uh, Thank 
is Jim Fearing with her from the bar. Um, two questions, one about this graph. How close are we to the point at which the atmosphere will not be able to recover, even with uh, best endeavours and measures? And um, the second question is, um, what is the biggest contributor to our 1.5% of our contribution? Look, no, no one can predict the future, much less science. <coughs> so we can't predict what will happen in terms of shifting climate system and impact of greenhouse gases. What we do is project. Right, there is the, there's the, the projection envelope. There, from worst case to best case scenario, best case to worst case scenario. We have now built in enough greenhouse gas <coughs> to take us to about this point. Yeah. And that's why scientists say that this is the critical decade. This is the decade where, and that's what this presentation is called, this is the decade where we will make or break the system. We have to start making advances in reducing greenhouse gases this decade so that we can cut even more deeply next decade to have a chance to stay below the two degree. Boundary. If we don't make the cuts this decade, we will have lost the opportunity because, no, I shouldn't say it that way, we won't have lost it, it just becomes increasingly difficult, more extensive to achieve what's required. Because early action is, is so valuable. It's like, it's like, imagine paying off a house, you know, where you're paying it off monthly and you can manage it. If you leave that until the last year of the payment, you go bankrupt, you can't afford to do it. The same is true with greenhouse gas reductions. You've got to start early and, and do it bit by bit to be able to do it cost effectively and, and, and make the transition you need. Yeah, you know, scientists agree we should have been starting two decades ago when this problem became evident. We haven't, we've sat on our hands for various reasons. Action now is happening this decade, but it's very uncertain as to whether we'll be able to make the reductions that are required. It's going to take a huge concerted global effort with a lot of goodwill and a lot of people sticking by their pledges. Because you know that action now is not happening under a legally binding global treaty. It's happening under a series of agreements called the which started off in Copenhagen in 2009 called Copenhagen Accord. And nations have pledged to do significant things. Australia's made a, a, a unilateral pledge supported by both sides of politics to reduce our emissions by 5% uh, below 2000 levels. So it's an ambitious target, but um, uh, it, it's achievable and we need, really do need to achieve it. Um, uh, other nations have done the same. The US has, done, has pledged to reduce by 17% below 2005 levels. They're already at minus 7%. So, you know, actions being in China's done the same sort of thing. But all of those actions only add up to about half of what's required to avoid dangerous climate change. So we need to increase our ambition probably next decade. We'd be lucky to see it happen this decade, but we're very, very slow when we see the, the difficulty of taking action in the case of Australia. The second part was, which is the biggest contributor in Australia to our... The biggest single contributor here is, is the electricity sector. Here in this state, 94% of your electricity is generated from, from coal, from ground coal. You've got some of the oldest, most inefficient ground coal uh, power plants on the planet here in this state. You've got the best wind resources uh, in, virtually in the country, magnificent wind resources. You've got plenty of solar. Uh, you, you've got a you've got, you know, great community action. In fact, I mean, you've, got one of the, you've got the only community-owned wind farm in the country up at, uh, at Dunsford. Um, but it's just not happening fast enough. So we're not moving fast enough to, 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 to do it. Any questions? Tim, uh, Charles Berger from McCullough Roberts Boys in Brisbane. Um, just on, uh, when you said, it was interesting when you said um, this is all as, as a result of our success in the field and I just wonder what kind of role you see in terms of creating a dialogue with the world's biggest polluters and, and how do you approach that dialogue when you have to explain that the, these biggest polluters' success is actually not <coughs> a benefit for the rest of the world? Well, look, a lot of people flatly deny it. I was talking to some representatives from Peabody Coal last year and they just flatly denied that climate change was a reality. Uh, and yet, you know, I talk to other companies where, where there's a public denial of climate change, and yet as they plan their forward infrastructure, they're incorporating in all the data the science given on sea level rise and so forth. So there's a very cynical, sceptical view of that. Um, I'm not sure quite how to, to approach that. It, it's, it's a very, very difficult problem. Um, 
I guess all I can say is that industries and economies change over time. I mean, in Australia, where I grew up, people drove on the ships back. You know, there was only sheep farmers out in the valley who drive their Rolls Royces around for the prize ram on the back seat. You know, that, that Australia's gone. I mean, we're now in quarry. We're now, you know, uh, a big iron ore and coal quarry. That, that will change in time, too. Um, so, um, will it change fast enough? That's the question. Can you pass the microphone behind you, Spencer? <clears throat> Tim, thank you for that um, presentation. It was very convincing. Can I just take you to Copenhagen for a minute? Um, as I interpreted what happened in Copenhagen, there was significant cleavage that opened up between countries from the north and countries from the south, between developed countries and developing countries. And the developing countries, it seems to me, were saying, and I think still are to some extent, well, <coughs> countries would you caused problems um, in the process of industrialization and now you're expecting us to make a major contribution to fixing those problems even though we haven't yet taken on economically uh, and it's that north-south cleavage it seems to me that represents one of the major logjams in achieving significant progress uh, in finding solutions including legal solutions in the form of international binding international treaties uh, which might assist us to uh, deal with this problem. So can you comment on that and tell me a little bit about how you see that long term being broken, if you can? Sure. Look, I was chair of the Copenhagen Climate Council in the three years running up to Copenhagen and participated in the meeting, so I was fairly close to all of that stuff. And since then I've been advising uh, a couple of industries, including a large energy company in India, so I see pretty close to those issues. Um, what you described there was historically the case. So the Kyoto Protocol, in fact, was based on that division between developed countries and developing countries. In Copenhagen, that division started to break down. And it started to break down as a series of nations, including coral atoll nations of the world, such as Tuvalu and others, started to say to large developing countries, hey guys, what you're proposing is not good enough. So a rift developed in the G77, between those who saw that two degrees of warming would destroy their nations, so the coral atoll countries would go underwater if we go to two degrees, so that was their fear, and countries like China that wanted to continue to pollute. Now, when Wen Jibao turned up at those meetings, he had a retinue of 800 people. He swanned in like, I have the solution, because China had taken all this fabulous action. And then he was criticised by the G77. And if you look at the amount of investment that China is putting into developing countries around the world now, particularly Africa. The G77 group is incredibly important to them. For them, what you painted as the great saint, was people previously pointed the US, created an enormous crisis in the Chinese uh, who, who, who arrived in Copenhagen. They had no idea how to handle it. And when just retreated into his hotel room and sent ever more junior kind of emissaries out to deal with the problem. That lockdown was broken when President Obama met with, he forced his way to a meeting, or sort of a right down now, anyway, between Mumbai and Sikh from India, when, and um, South African and Brazilian leaders. And they forged a thing called the Copenhagen Accord, which was not part of this legal thing that the UNFCCC were working on, but was a separate agreement. And it was, it's a, it was a five page document, the title was on one page, the last two pages were blank. It was two pages of text, didn't say a lot, but what it did say was we want to keep the world below two degrees and individual countries need to pledge some action to do this. That has been, I think, a hugely successful way forward. We now have about half the emission reduction pledges that we need to get to safety, that two degrees. Um, sure, they're not legally binding, but how shameful is it for a country to set its own target voluntarily and then hope to meet it? So, the negotiations at the moment, they're very focused on those pledges, on making sure that they're transparent, that people can't fudge the data, that we actually can see what those actions are, that we can correlate from one of actions across to another. That's all tedious stuff, difficult stuff. There are also, since Durban, as you've probably read in the paper, um, <coughs> new moves to create a legally binding treaty post-2020, but there's no doubt for this decade it's the Copenhagen Accord that's going to be driving change. Um, Britain has unilaterally upped its ambitions under the Accord just last year. Um, there's room for other countries to do that. We shall see there's a whole lot of factors that are operating at the moment that I think are pushing us on the right trajectory. 
One of the most interesting is coming out of China. It's the decline in the cost of production for solar panels. It's been the most extraordinary thing to watch over the last two years as Australian technology has been taken by the Chinese and they've reduced the cost of production by 10% per quarter for the last two years. Extraordinary advances. So those sort of things are going to empower the free market to really make significant change. Thank you. Yeah. Might, uh, might leave the, the, the questions there. So, uh, could you all please uh, join me in, in thanking? <laughs>